Driving. Hello, uh, good morning, good afternoon, uh, good evening, depending on where you are. Uh, this is the Music Ally uh, weekly show. Uh, I'm broadcasting from Berlin. I'm Joe Sparrow. Uh, and uh, while we wait for the next few people to arrive, let's uh, go around and do some quick introductions. Uh, the gentleman in the hat with an A on it. Uh, that is Patrick Ross of Music hey. Ally. How's uh, it going? I'm, I'm good. I'm, I'm, thanks for, I'm very, thanks very for having me back onto the show. I thought after some of my comments, you might have picked somebody else, but I appreciate it. Uh, Patrick Ross, SVP of Digital Strategy at the wonderful Music Ally, uh, which I'll tell you a little bit more about in a few minutes. Fabulous. Thank you. And uh, Hen, regular uh, guest, Hen Heimdall. Uh, thank you for joining us. Looking wonderful as always with your greenery behind you there. Thanks for having me. Uh, always I'm a pleasure. Hen from CD Baby, and I do market development for Europe. Great, thank you. And uh, well, uh, let's leave this very special guest to last. Uh, joining us uh, from the kitchen, I believe, this week, uh, it's uh, Stuart Dredge, Music Allies editor. Hi, Stu, how are you? Hi, good. I've just dealt with an internet outage one minute before coming on, so I've run up to the house. So I'm now, anything could happen now, cats, children, anything. Excellent, <laughs> good character is always good. And our mm. very special guest, all the way from, are you in New York, uh, Jason? Yeah, Queens, New, New York. New York City. In the Jason Hoven from Chartmetric, uh, very special guest this week. Thank you very much for joining us. Hi, everybody. Jason Hoven from uh, Chartmetric, uh, manager of content and insights in New York. Wonderful. Thanks for having me. Uh, great. Thank you. And I think um, uh, most people are joining us now. There's a few people still coming in, but we'll get started. Uh, now, uh, this week, we're going to be talking about the effect of coronavirus on uh, streaming. Obviously, there's been a lot of conversation for the last six weeks about the effect of coronavirus. Uh, on, uh, for example, live areas of the industry, which have clearly been strongly affected. Um, but we've not, we've been making sort of guesses so far about how it's affecting streaming. Uh, well, uh, Jason uh, and Chartmetric have uh, just released their first deep dive uh, data driven analysis. And uh, Jason has very kindly agreed to come along and explain it a bit. And we're going to look at it in um, connection to a strategy going forward uh, in other parts of the music industry. And that's where uh, Hen and Patrick will come into play. Uh, now, Patrick, I'm going to invite you uh, initially to quickly describe, while everyone's uh, arriving, what Music Ally is and, is and what it does. Great. Thanks, Joe. Pleasure. Um, hopefully, most of you know who we are and what we do, and that's why you've tuned in today, and we are so thankful to have you. Um, but Music Ally is, of course, a knowledge company. Um, hopefully, most of you will know us from uh, our publication. Um, anybody that did, does need to subscribe will pop Anthony at Music Ally's name into the chat. Um, by the way, we will be manning the chat, so uh, I've got some of my team in there if you've got any questions. Um, if you do have Q&A uh, for the actual, uh, this session, if you pop those into the Q&A box, we'll be watching those to bring them online. But yeah, Music Ally, we write about everything digital and music, which Stu's going to tell you about some of our news that we've had coming through. Uh, we train the global music industry uh, on how to be better at marketing music. Um, and then we actually uh, work hands-on with clients. Uh, up and until recently, we did uh, events, which is why we've now gone online. Um, but watch this space as we may have a global event being now announced soon. But yeah, the best thing to do is make sure to sign up, subscribe, and read us. Again, I'll put Anthony's uh, email into the chat for everybody. Yeah, we'll put the, of course, we do have the, the chat function here, which you can access. There is a Q&A function, as uh, Patrick mentioned. So we'll, the, the chat function will be more for sort of technical things like sharing uh, links, email addresses, and things like that. And uh, Patrick and our secret uh, Music Ally uh, uh, partner, Kush, is uh, behind the scenes. And they'll answer some of those questions by text. And other ones we will ask, uh, we'll answer on air here. Now, so the way this panel is going to work is it's going to happen shortly. But first of all, um, we're going to talk to um, Stu about a couple of the most interesting news stories of the week. Uh, and it's worth pointing out at this point, um, that there will be a podcast of this show available in a couple of days, and the whole video of this will be viewable again on YouTube uh, shortly. But first of all, let's get on to the, I think the name is embedded now, Stu. It is Stu's News. Um, Still and this, a good name for it that's not that. <laughs> I, I think if it, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And it certainly mm. isn't broke. Uh, so <laughs> with that in mind, we have two really interesting news stories this week. Um, uh, one which was a news story today, and uh, perhaps we'll start with that one because it's so pertinent, the uh, OpenAI jukebox. 
yeah. we've talked about AI a lot in the music industry, uh, how it's going to steal everyone's jobs and change everything. That's a bit of hyperbole. But what is this and, and what's so special about this new announcement? Yeah, it's stealing everyone's jobs. And then it's um, so open AI is the um, it's a nonprofit uh, AI company. It's actually so Elon Musk, the Tesla space rockets, uh, saying weird things about divers, man. He's the he's a backer of it. I don't think it's his company. I think he's a backer of it amongst other people in Silicon Valley. And they're doing a lot of research into all kinds of artificial intelligence. So it was the company that did the thing um, that could write based on give, being given a bit of text. It would carry on writing it and write news stories and so on. That was in the press last year. Um, and it did some things last year around music, about can you generate music through AI, which you can. Um, and its new thing is called Jukebox, which, yeah, basically is it can, uh, it can create songs. It can take 12 seconds of a song and then carry it on. It can write, it can write original music in the style of a certain artist or a certain genre. Uh, and it's, it came out yesterday and basically it's got, people who know about AI music are super excited about it, but it's really advanced. It's, it's like a step on in lots of ways. It's interesting. And I think people in the music world are looking at it kind of with a mixture of fear and anticipation and excitement and disgust. And, you know, it's either kind of celebrate this or burn it down or, or a combination of the two. It certainly does seem like a step forward, doesn't it? Because we've, you know, you and I have talked a lot about AI music over the years, and it's it's been sort of a fun experiment so far, with some interesting melodies being made or interesting lyrics being generated, but often erring on the side of slightly uh, weird, sort of closer mm. to Mark E. Smith than uh, than anybody else in terms of lyricism. Um, uh, but this is this is a fundamental change. It, and there's a couple of elements here. The, the first one is, and the one that really struck me was it can sing believably or they described it as rudimentary singing but i consider myself to be a rudimentary singer and it's much better than me at singing yeah so it's like it's two separate areas so one is this area of ai composition and the other is this area of speech syn synthesis very hard for a human to say i think an ai could say it better um which is the idea of can you can you basically have a famous singer singing something they didn't do in the real world so can you have a synthetic version of them singing so this the experiment yesterday they had frank sinatra singing a song about hot tub christmas which is a new a new notable. standard in the american songbook um uh so yeah so it's kind of it's a mixture of original music but also yeah they can they can train it on a certain artist uh, catalog and have i mean for example they had rick astley's never going to give you up which i think is kind of a joke to have that in the thing and they had the first 12 seconds of the original song the recording and then it kind of goes off in its own direction like what if rick astley had sung a completely different tune yeah. with the same lyrics but the chorus is, is okay, isn't it? It generates a new chorus and it's okay. You know, it's, it's all right. It's, it's not kind of as good. Like you think it wouldn't become the meme it had. So yeah. so the stuff around this is kind of technically it's really interesting in advance and, and exciting. And it, it kind of people are already picking over how much did they spend doing it. I had someone who knows their stuff says, I reckon they spent $30 million doing this. Like it's it's a lot of effort and resource. Yeah. Um, but from a music point of view, I think we're all looking at going, what does this mean for copyright? Mm. So what does it mean that you can train it on an artist's catalog? Is that copyright? Is that link? And then there's kind of lots of discussion about it. We talked to a, a lawyer who knows her onions in this, um, Sophie Goosen, last year, and she said, in the US, it's kind of seen as fair use. You can take an artist's catalog, right. train it on it, and you probably don't have to ask permission or get a license. But yeah. like a lot of legal things, it's kind of lawyers go, well, it's in discussion. We don't really know yet until someone pays us loads of money. To yeah, I was about to say that musicians perhaps are... Uh, uh, a bit frightened of this, but lawyers are rubbing their hands together because, you know, for, for instance, it, it, there is a, a conversation here about um, intellectual property. You, you're taking, when you listen to the lyrics, for instance, as being sung, it clearly sounds like the artist. So there's, there's a, a question over um, intellectual property in terms of the image rights, or the image rights, the, 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 the rights of the artist to, to, and what they sound like, the moral rights. But then there's also, you can, I'm not saying that the words are sampled, but you can tell they're synthesized using sort of sampled sound, if you like. Mm. It's a very complicated area, isn't it? Yeah, and there are some things that are straightforward, like if lyrics are licensed. If you're using the lyrics of a copyright song, there is a, there's a thing there. And if you're putting music out, which, you know, this music has been put on SoundCloud, which is yeah. a kind of a, a, again, another one to itself in terms of what happens now. Um, so yeah, so there's kind of, it's, it's, so one way of putting it is it's really fascinating if you stand back and so mm. these, are really, these are really interesting copyright discussions, interesting technical things. But I think if you're a musician looking at this, you are going to be a bit trepidating. You know, what does this mean for me? Um, and one of the things that music ally, we've kind of, our party line, I suppose, is as a musician, you can kind of, you should be leaning into this stuff anyway, like mm. figuring out how it works, and prodding it and poking it, we wrote this morning, like 
rather than kind of just running away or kind of shouting in anger, go and like mess with it, go and try it, go and understand it. And then you'll kind of be able to form an opinion on what it means. Yeah. And that might, you might still think it's bad, but you'll be coming from a position of kind of, well, I've played with it, I've understood it. Authority, yeah. It certainly um, could be a, a, an amazing composition tool as a starting point for a song, couldn't it? Please? Yeah. And the other thing to say is these people who open AI, they are doing it for research. They're not really trying to make a big music startup and make loads of money by creating AI music. They're doing it to explore what AI is capable of. So they don't really have a business in mind, which in a sense is good. They're not, they're doing this purely for research point of view. In another sense, maybe they're not thinking about the commercial effect it could have on musicians mm. in the industry. So there's kind of, a, it's one of those, I know we say technology is disruptive and it's kind of a, a vacuous buzzword. But it's a sort of thing where people do it and they're not really maybe thinking about what well, it might mean this and that in the future. Right. So that's what we've got to kind of understand. And that's why leaning into it will help us to kind of figure out what it does mean. And you yeah, know, it's, the, the it's certainly too early to, to say exactly where it's going to go, but it's uh, definitely worth checking out because it's a really fascinating piece of technology. And I did notice mm -hmm. uh, before we move on that in the first sentence of their um, uh, on, on their website describing this, there were four citations uh, explaining how that uh, machine generated music is over 50 years old which i thought was a mm. nice uh, they're clearly trying to set the precedent that this is nothing new and don't sue us um but talking about musicians making money um mm. spotify's q1 of first quarter financial results were announced this week uh perhaps you could tell us about that in the context of your exclusive chat with daniel x spotify founder i don't know if it's exclusive well i think there was a conveyor belt of journalists getting seven minutes on the phone <laughs> yeah, exclusively to Music Hello. No, yeah. yeah, so it's the first time done, actually. The first time they talked to journalists around their financial results. Like, you got to kind of dial in, have seven minutes, and you know, ask whatever you wanted. Um, so that was interesting. Um, but yeah, so their results were good. So Spotify's quarter one, they've now got 130 million subscribers, um, which is, means they've added 6 million in, in the, the last quarter. So about 1.5 million new people signing up for subscription every month. Um, they've got 286 million active users. Um, so, they are, so they're kind of, they're still growing. And then the Spotify is now, what, 11 years old, 12 years old? Yeah. Like it's still growing pretty rapidly. And the big thing I think a lot of us were looking at was what would the cold coronavirus thing have meant for them? Yes. Uh, and so what they said, what Spotify said was one, one, they, at the end of the quarter, they saw advertising fall. And they were very keen to stress advertising is very small for Spotify, it's like 10% of their revenues. So they were saying, we're okay, like the revenues didn't get affected by this really, because it's all subscriptions. Um, second was like the habits. And they said, actually, yeah, they've seen it shift from mobile commute time listening to home and devices like smart speakers and games, consoles and TVs, which you'll be talking about later on in much more detail. Yeah. Um, so they kind of confirmed that the idea of a shift in listening to by device and by kind of time. Um, and they kind of talked a bit about churn, which is the really important thing. So like we've had these reports recently about uh, have audio streams fallen. And is that a bad thing? Because everyone's watching Netflix or listening to the radio instead. And I think as we talked about a couple of weeks ago, it doesn't affect the money coming in because the same amount of subscriptions means the same amount of royalties. If there's less streams, it means a higher per stream rate. To yeah. that. But the problem would come if people started canceling their subscriptions because they don't feel they can afford it or because they think they're using other things more. Mm. Um, and what we got from there is they saw a little uptick at the end of the quarter in churn. And they said it was more about payment failures. So people's cards not being, you know, not paying or whatever than it was about people cancelling. But they did sort of suggest that there has been a few, a little kind of trend possibly starting of people going, you know what, I can't afford a streaming description this time, I'm gonna drop down. Mm. Um, and there were two things around that. So one was Spotify, Spotify kind of might seem at a disadvantage because if you cancel Spotify premium, you still have Spotify, you're just on the ad funded service and you still have it. So kind of you could argue it's an easier decision to cancel than if you cancel Netflix, you don't have Netflix yeah. and you can't watch it. But they were saying it differently. They were saying, well, actually, it means we still have them as a customer. If they can't afford to pay, they're still a customer for us. And when they when it, this, this ends and they have more money, they might come back and they're still with us. Mm. And they even suggested that they've actually, they, they, they've seen people coming back, laps customers, people who haven't been on Spotify for a while have come back. And Daniel Leck, the CEO, suggested that actually, maybe it's people coming back from rival streaming services where they have no free tier and they're coming to us, which, I'm not sure music people are going to be that happy about. Like, oh, isn't it great? Everyone's cancelling their Apple Music subscription and going to Spotify's free tier. Like, it's kind of a slightly tentative subject. Yeah, um, it's complicated, isn't it? That it's yeah, and it's, there's, there's a sort of slight indicator for 
uh, what might happen in the future. We, we're, we're talking, you know, this phrase, the new normal is is, being, is almost a cliche now, but obviously the next steps in, in the, going forward in the next few months, we're walking into a very different landscape in the music industry, especially in, in streaming. And this is going to bring us very uh, beautifully to uh, talking to Jason shortly. Um, but yeah. well, um, the other thing I was going to say, actually, not to break in, let no, me have no. my say. <laughs> um, no, um, the other thing that came out of the interview that I thought was interesting uh, was I asked Daniel Ek, uh, this artist fundraising pick, so 50,000 artists are using this artist fundraising pick to raise money either for themselves or charities. And um, that was one of the numbers announced. And I asked him like, does this kind of, is there any reason why this couldn't be deeper in the platform? Like fan, proper fan funding baked into Spotify, proper mm -hmm. crowdfunding or ongoing. Or... And he said, no, there's no reason why not. And he was, he kind of basically alluded to the fact that going forward as they're doing this two-sided marketplace, which is their big strategy, um, that fan funding, artist direct funding, there's no reason why it couldn't pop. So that was that was what I thought was interesting. That they they've been doing this thing where you can raise money through PayPal or Cash App or the other thing they do. Yeah. But I it, it came across to me that they are genuinely thinking about this could be a permanent feature of Spotify of fans donating or paying artists in some way. And it, it wasn't like an announcement. He's very kind of he knows what he's he knows not what to say and you know how to keep yeah. things away. But I did come away thinking that would be really interesting if Spotify properly put their weight behind it. Um, and during the analyst call yesterday, a couple of analysts had questions like, could this be a bigger part of Spotify's platform, fan funding? And when analysts are saying that, it kind of gives you a sense that maybe Wall Street likes the idea of Spotify layering in fan funding because it sees an opportunity. So that would be, if there's something that ticks the boxes, like good for artists, possibly liked by Wall Street. I know, yeah. I'm fascinated. But I know it's quite, it's another sensitive issue. I know a lot of musicians are saying this is, this is just showing that the stream rates are terrible. Right, insulting. I like. There's a, there's actually quite a lot of there's, there's anger out there as well as people going. This is great. So it's it's yes, going to be a really it, yeah. Yeah, a lot of people are saying that you know it's uh, one of the things that uh, Daniel X said in your article was you get great value for money for nine ninety nine a month, and the, the artist might be saying, well, doesn't that show that you're undervaluing music? So there's a, uh, there's and maybe that ability to pay artists through the app is is a sort of halfway house solution to that. I don't know. The other thing as well is he and in, in, in the other school, uh, some, oh no, no, it was me. No, I, 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 they were all blurring into one yesterday. So there was another school and then a call with me. Uh, and I asked about, no, oh God. Do you know what it's, this is what it's like now? Time loops and you forget which one. Anyway, he was asked about price rises. Yes. And he said, basically we've tried it and people didn't mind. And it's good to know that's an option, although we're not doing it now. Whereas in the past, it's always been like, we're not doing price rises, we're just focusing on growth. Mm. And now the message is kind of like, well, we, it's good that we've got price rises as an option when this bad time is over. And that ties in with people actually starting to talk more about, well, if Spotify is going to pay people more, what they need to do is raise the price because that's the way to raise the payments. Yeah. So that was interesting. Again, a little hint that maybe Spotify will rise in price soon and that will be the thing that has a, a significant, oh, how much I've learned. But again, it's all kind of speculation until they announce it. Mm. Okay, good. Well, thank you, Stu. That's a uh, uh, very comprehensive look at two of the, two very big stories this week. Uh, I appreciate you see how very frazzled much. doing this news makes someone. But no, I will let you go back to herding cats in the kitchen now, okay. uh, and I'm grateful for uh, for you joining us. Stu's going to uh, leave us shortly, uh, and then we're going to move on to the panel. But thanks again, Stu. Uh, very you. grateful for you joining us as always, and uh, good to see you. See you next week. See you next week. Bye bye. Bye bye. Okay, uh, so uh, it's just the four of us. Uh, and uh, well, we're going to move on to the panel topic now, which is a lovely segue from the last part that Stu was talking about. Uh, just before we start, uh, next week is a public holiday in a lot of European countries. Uh, so there is no panel uh, going to happen next Friday. But the following Friday, we're back on the 15th of May. And uh, we're going to be discussing, we hope, uh, innovative releasing techniques in 2020 on streaming platforms, uh, or maybe even uh, physical as well. Something very relevant to the uh, uh, coronavirus world, um, particularly interesting for um, artists who have catalog and they're looking for ways to use it when they can't tour, for instance. So that is on the 15th of May in, in two weeks time, but next week there is no show because uh, it's a public holiday. And so here we are, uh, Jason, uh, the, the spotlight falls on you. Um, so let me introduce the topic really briefly and then perhaps you can tell us what this, this piece of research is, what it means, what you did and what the basic learnings are. Um, there's been a lot of discussion about how live industries have been affected by uh, coronavirus. But what about music streaming? We sort of, we can make assumptions. Perhaps people aren't traveling to work as much and aren't streaming. They're not listening at the office and trying to block out people next to them. So they're not streaming as much. 
um, but these are guesses and you've had a good look at it in terms of data. So, uh, and this is a three part piece of research you're doing. You've released the first part. We'll share the, uh, the link to, the, um, uh, to the, the data in the chat room shortly, but can you tell us what you were looking for or what you were trying to find out by doing this research and, and perhaps explain what Chartmetric does as well and what you do there. Yeah, for sure. Uh, thanks, Joe. Uh, and hey, everybody. Um, hope everyone's uh, safe and happy. Happy Friday. Um, my name is Jason. I work for a music analytics company called Chartmetric. We started in 2016. Uh, we service uh, artists, their teams, managers, branding agencies, people in the live space, labels, of course. And um, we're essentially a tool that collects data from streaming platforms, from social media platforms, and we kind of put it all in one place in the dashboard. And we charge a subscription fee. Um, we have an API and essentially people use our business to make just smarter, faster business decisions with music. Whether it has to do with followers or audience demographics, uh, playlisting, that kind of thing. Um, so we're kind of in a really good position to take a kind of like a market level kind of as comprehensive as you can look at kind of the industry in general and from different angles. And so that's why we're doing this three part series about COVID because obviously it's affected so many parts of um, our industry. And we just wanna try to put some useful information out there so people can make use of it, hopefully somehow. Um, so this first part that we did was looking at the genre level. So um, like Joe had mentioned, um, you know, I think probably most of us have already read um, some of the really great work that Nielsen's been doing, um, Billboard and MRC um, data um, talking about um, you know, from a survey perspective, from a straight streaming perspective, kind of like how has consumption gone? Um, has it gone up? Has it gone down? You know, with the lifestyle change. And I, so we just wanted to add to that conversation and, you know, in the spirit of kind of just an academic approach and just trying to complete the picture. And so we decided to take like a genre level um, approach to it to start. And so we just kind of focused on one platform, which was Spotify in this case. And um, trying to look at, you know, did pop go up? Did rap go down? Did Latin go up? Did country go down? Um, maybe none of that happened and everything is just kind of like not even genre related. Um, but we just thought we would make the assumption that, you know, each one of these, you know, sounds has a certain listener base that maybe right. affected their geography in a certain way or affected their lifestyle in a certain way that maybe was different from other genres like listening. Did, did you have any guesses before you start? I mean, I, I, I know it's not a very scientific way to start, but did you have any sort of feelings about what genres may people may have lent more into in, in this time of crisis and, and steered away from? Yeah, I mean, so I think it already come out that uh, classical was um, had had went up uh, substantially, and so that was one for sure. I think children's was the other kind of field that right. I think most of us probably have not thought too much about. Um, day to day um, in terms of genre, but uh, that was another one we expected to go up. Everything else we weren't really sure. Um, yeah, those are probably like the two big ones, I would say. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, at this point, I must just remind people, if you've got a question, as, as Jason's talking about data, uh, if you've got any specific questions that you might, you think that Jason uh, hasn't answered that you might have, please do hit the Q&A button and ask, um, and it will be either answered on air or um, if it's a more general question uh, in text. And of course, if uh, uh, Patrick and Hen, you have a question, please do jump in as well. Um, so what were the most notable things that you, you saw then in this research? Yeah, so uh, the most notable I'd say was so we looked at listenership. So that wasn't, it's not necessarily streams going up or down. So that's just kind of like this kind of how deep is, is listening going up. And so we looked at kind of, if you're familiar with like our advertising reach, like how wide a listenership got, they have this statistic called Spotify monthly listeners, which is essentially a number that talks about how many people like unique listeners listen to a certain um, artist or not. And so that's what we looked at because we wanted to kind of look at whether it was kind of getting bigger and smaller. So in that case, um, we did confirm, um, as, to the best of our knowledge, uh, that classical, ambient, and children's, those three, um, their listenership kind of widened um, kind of during that like kind of mid-March period, which was kind of the, kind of like that, that stake in the road where we felt like, you know, on the timeline of, you know, the world, like March 15th-ish mm. was kind of when lockdown started to happen kind of en masse, you know, kind of in a lot of the countries that Spot Spotify's listenership is. Um, so that was kind of like a big takeaway. We definitely confirmed uh, those couple things. I think for the ones that were relatively kind of narrowing is how we put it. So essentially the- yeah, what, what do you mean by widening and narrowing? In this yeah, yeah, yeah. So we very specifically decided on that language because we, we wanted to make sure that people didn't think we were measuring streams. 
Um, that's not something we were working on in this particular case. Um, and I think that's where most of the kind of industry-wide conversation had gone. Um, of course, for obvious reasons, because, you know, it's, it's a very easy to understand. It's like YouTube views, you know, it's very easy to understand um, what that was. But so we just wanted to really kind of like clarify that this is more about um, reach, you know, hmm. you could have, you know, 100 fans listening to doing a, a, a million streams, which is great for that artist, but it doesn't necessarily mean that the, like, it was a lot of people. You know, it, it could very much be just a small one of people streaming a lot. Yeah. So we wanted to just kind of give a different angle with looking at, um, yeah, uh, the whole widening, narrowing thing. That's why that language is there. Right. And so, so we're, 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 spill the beans then. Which, which genres are up and, or wider and which ones are narrowing? Yeah, yeah. So, so with, with the widening, for sure, classical ambient children's. Um, with the narrowing, we, we saw Latin rap and rock to narrow during the period which was like basically early march to early april is what we were looking at trying to focus on that very kind of decisive before and after um with um covid uh, lockdowns and although we couldn't necessarily determine it was that um but now we've actually ran it again uh, a lot of the tests that we did since uh, in the past like couple weeks right. and found that they actually did continue to to lower and it was different from this time of year in 2019 right um a big part of kind of what we wanted to do is be a little bit more rigorous and try to look at well is this just like the normal patterns that happen with latin rap or pop or any one of these genres you know between 2020 this time of year and in 2019 and looking at that comparison from an even wider perspective it seems to still continue to differentiate itself um, from last year. So, so Latin rap and rock, uh, that relationship seemed to narrow on Spotify. And then pop, country, and dance seems to be relatively unaffected, country especially. Um, for whatever reason, country fans on Spotify seems to just, they're having a great time. <laughs> I, I don't I'm know tricking. what it is. Yeah, yeah, they, yeah. they're yeah. having a great time. Um, they're uh, just, so uh, this time of year and last year and this year in 2020, Spotify listenership for country music just seems to be relatively unaffected um, mm. by um, COVID lockdown for whatever reason. You know, I, I can only assume that the listenership is mostly based um, in maybe the America, the UK, right. um, Australia. Um, but yeah, I, I, you know, we can only do so much. I, I can only conjecture on, on uh, why. What about sort of, uh, Patrick, I know you have a question to, to mention in a second. If you, just before we get there, perhaps, on this point, were you able to sort of see any geographic variables based on perhaps as you know, coronavirus is moving in, in different rates around the world and hitting different parts? Were you able to see any kind of behavioral differences or have you not looked at that yet? Not yet. So that's going to be part two. Um, we're going to be looking at YouTube views for kind of top artists. Uh, well, no, YouTube views for top artists um, in six different countries. Um, okay, great. Okay, yeah. well, so, so, to, be, to be continued. Uh, yeah. Patrick? Yeah. Um, so I had a question, which I'm going to go ahead and assume this is a typo, uh, and they're not talking about poop, but rather pop. Um, but the narrowing of pop, Latin, and rock, uh, Jason, is comparative, uh, is the question. Um, please correct this person if they're wrong, but total, total listeners for them in the world would be bigger numbers. Does that make sense? Uh, like overall for the listenership? I believe so. So he's asking total listeners for the world would be bigger, but Latin pop and rock is comparative was the question. Well, the, the narrowing of those three genres. Yeah, yeah. yeah. no, um, that is, that's within itself. They're being compared to themselves. Okay, that's great. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. And that's comparing year on year. So look, you're looking back to last year and, and the difference. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, so essentially the whole year to year comparison was to try to, you know, narrow out, you know, is in the spring, does do people just listen to a lot more Latin music because they like to party? And yeah. that's like a normal thing. Um, you know, and we wanted to kind of like, you know, equalize for that. So essentially, if there was a difference between 2019, 2020, um, that's what we were looking for. Right. Okay. Um, and yeah, the, of course, the, the the we'll move on to the other two panelists and perhaps talk about this in a sort of we understand the change in behavior and how the, what this might mean for people working in the music industry. But do you were there anything was there anything else you noticed? I mean, the, 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 I saw some of the graphs on this very uh, comprehensive report you put out, and it, it seems to be like a, a very notable change. You know, year on year, there's a there's a point where you see certain genres just go down and other others really take off. Yeah, I mean have you started to address or hypothesize reasons behind it because that you know i'm thinking from a marketer's perspective 
um, which is a little bit crass, I guess, uh, in, in, a res in some respects. But they also want to know, if people want this, can we get them this thing that they want? And have you been able to sort of steer down that route? Yeah, I mean, you know, the classical and, and ambient thing, you know, it's the assumption is, you know, it wasn't just from us that, you know, people are working from home. Those that can, that are, that are lucky enough to work from home, they need something that is not as distracting. They don't need, you know, Pitbull going, ooh wee, you know, in the background while they're like writing emails, you know, they, they need something maybe, to- maybe you don't, but- uh... <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. Um, you know, they need something more low key, you know, lo-fi beats is like such a huge, um, you know, subgenre for ambient. Yeah. Um, and classical music is obviously uh, a very obvious one. Um, it's very peaceful. And so, you know, obviously that's like one of the obvious ones with children's as well. A lot of parents are dealing with that balance between, you know, keeping the kids busy and, you know, at the same time getting stuff done um, in the same place. And then when it comes to, let's say, pop and, you know, hip hop, you know, those two in particular seem to just go about business as usual. And for us, um, that just was fairly interesting. We thought that, um, and we actually are seeing that hip hop is actually still continuing to decline, which is different from last year in 2019. Right. And so that can, we can only uh, assume or conjecture that that's probably because there are just, there's a lot of less kind of like of this music playing, um, you know, on the commutes because they don't exist anymore yeah. um, at, you know, parties, um, you know, if, if there are clubs or bars that are playing, you know, music on Spotify and, you know, not through, you know, another way um, that, you know, those are some of the, you know, obvious ones for sure. Sure. Well, let's, I mean, um, I can see there's a few questions in the chat, uh, people asking about specific countries. Um, if you go to the link on the, the chart metric link, you, you should see a sort of uh, some country by country breakdown and certain graphs. So you can perhaps dig into that a little bit further. Um, perhaps we can move uh, to Patrick and Hen. You know, what, um, and Jason, feel free to jump in at any point with, with, with interesting information. Um, what we've got here is some some quite interesting data, which shows people's behaviors are changing because of this external event. Perhaps we didn't anticipate in this way. We, we might have just have thought of it increasing or decreasing overall, but we're talking about genre level change. Um, this is the, the million dollar question then. How can people who are working with music, whether it's artists who have music to be released or artists with catalog or artists who are looking for alternatives to performing live, how can they take advantage of, of this kind of information that people are looking for, they're looking for experience or sort of uh, emotion-based choices in, in their music. Uh, Hen, would you like to go first? Uh, it's uh, oh, always a pleasure to start with you. Um, I mean, I, th I think from an independent perspective, I think we can be quicker and more agile in a way to adapt to new trends within the marketplace. And and you know we we've been encouraging our artists and and labels to just keep releasing throughout this period we're, we're seeing an inc uh, incredible submission rates across the world and that's not just us you know rolling stone published an article recently detailing how how many people are actually pushing music out now and i think just you know keep, keep doing that especially if you're working within those genres where 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 you're seeing an increase in in consumption yeah I mean, Hen, you work at CD Baby, obviously, uh, which works with a lot of independent well, artists of all types and sizes, um, but, but with, with lots and lots of artists. Have you have you been able to see it? Have you seen more submissions, which is very interesting? Uh, have you understood or have you been able to figure out people's rationale behind, OK, let's release more music? I mean, the, the most obvious one is people cannot cannot rely on their live income for the for the foreseeable future therefore people are spending more time perhaps creating music and also pushing out music that have been sat on for a while um and i think i think people just have more time to focus on that and nurture their kind of digital relationships with their fans right which 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 is a good thing right it that's makes, it's it an makes, opportunity to really kickstart things yeah yeah that's uh, Patrick, what about you? I mean, you work, uh, perhaps you can describe a little bit more fully exactly how you work day to day in a kind of marketing sense in terms of advising artists. Um, but what, what do you think? I mean, again, without sounding crass, because, we're, you know, we're, what we're saying here is this is not about taking advantage of the situation, but people are demanding a different type of listening experience. So what kind of things could an artist do, as Hen says, in that sort of combining their their ability now to connect in a different way with being able to give people what they want? Um, 
Yeah, well, first, I just want to say another big thank you, Jason, for being here. Um, Chartmetric, if we as a company, Music Ally, if the whole industry didn't have Chartmetric to tell us some of these things um, and give us this data back to, because as soon as I saw this report and dug in, my thing, whenever Chartmetric releases something is crap. How do we respond? <laughs> They've, they're always ahead. And now how do we take this? Um, practically, I think the genre information is really interesting. And I thought it was really funny. I've, I've looked at the report um, and I do like a ex bit of experimental music, though not that often. I've been listening to Spongle lately and I saw them actually appear on your, uh, on your, on your charts there. Uh, and I've noticed my listening habits have actually changed. I've, I've been listening to a lot of just hit me in the face uh, pop music. At the same time, um, working with artists, uh, so going from that perspective, um, a lot of them have been asking me, Jason, uh, well, and everyone on here, should I be releasing music right now? For the past several weeks, should I be releasing music? And some people were like, no, this is not the time to release music. And this was all obviously conjecture. Uh, on the other side, people being like, yeah, everyone's locked down. And I really thank you, Chartmetric, for giving us something to dig into to understand how we should proceed in this time. Um, it does obviously raise a question, depending on what your genre is, um, of what you should be doing and how you should be responding. Um, obviously, as we always tell people, dig into platform provided tools as well. Obviously, Chartmetric gives us this amazing overview that you can't get anywhere else. Um, but also go into, you know, whether that's your Spotify for artists, your Apple Music for artists, your Instagram insights. Also dig into your own tools, see what's going on with your own audience and see if it marries up to what Chartmetric is seeing here uh, en masse uh, in, in a much wider sense. And I think that will help you have much better and more educated um, decisions. But yeah, I mean, as far as what I'm gonna do off the base of this, um, I'm gonna keep reading the piece of research. I'm gonna wait until Chartmetric keep giving me more uh, and then try to flow that down to uh, actionable insights to the various artists, whether that um, is a major label Interscope artist that I work with that released a record last week, or that is a, an indie pop artist out of Norway uh, that's looking to have an EP coming up. And, you know, some people are already on their release flow. They're already in progress with it. So it's, I, you know, I wouldn't say stop what you're doing, but also be aware and keep your head up as this data comes in and allow it to inform your decisions, um, if not just educate. Yeah, it is early days, isn't it? I mean, I mean, this is a huge step forward in terms of data uh, that Jason and Chartmetric have made. Um, but it, again, it's, it's a bit of a loaded question I threw to you, really, which is what do you do? And, and, and the question is, the answer is maybe, well, you're learning slowly as we move forward, but we're starting in, in a whole new world. Jason, how, how quickly do you think that, I know you've got another part of the report coming out, which you said was on YouTube, and was that stream numbers or? Um... Yeah, YouTube views. For... YouTube views, yeah, and then there's a third the part level. coming as well. Yeah, the third part's gonna be at the artist level for live streaming. So okay. um, our analytics intern, Michelle, she's been working really hard at doing some a lot of qualitative research on, um, for example, uh, Charlie XCX. She's been very active uh, on the live streaming uh, tidbit. Um, I think Metallica um, uh, has also been uh, very uh, active. And so looking at maybe like a, an equivalent artist in terms of like their sound, their demographic, but who have maybe has not been as active and then just kind of doing a very kind of case level approach on like, you know, how's that affected their Instagram followership or right. Spotify followership or so, whatever. So so people, artists out there, Hen, maybe you can, you know, you might want to chip in here, but you could actually, if you understand, it's worth in some ways understanding exactly who your equivalents are as an artist, whether they're bigger or smaller or sideways, but with a similar audience and a similar genre, maybe we're talking genre today, of course, and, and maybe taking some learnings from their behavior. Charlie XCX is a great example of someone who's completely reinvented what it is to be a pop star uh, in 2020 in, in just a few weeks um hen when you when on that note when you're talking to artists and saying you know i'm again i'm always talking to you uh sort of with regards to perhaps uh, emerging artists and up-and-coming artists who are in the growth phase how do you tell them to do that in, in terms of identifying which artist you know if if to find their Charlie XCX and saying, right, find who you're like, and how do you then measure the success of what they're doing so that you can quote unquote copy it? I mean, a little chart metric plug. Uh, they're offering two weeks now for free for in the artists. Go, go sign up, get an account. No, but they, they one of the sections on the dashboard very easily identifies kind of similar artists to you, ones that are slightly further behind, ones that are slightly further ahead, comparing playlists, et cetera, et cetera. Use tools like that and, and you know, 
Um, Spotify as well, you get similar to your sounds, similar to whatever that section is called, you know, tap into those sections and, and just start researching. What are they doing on their socials? What, are they, what kind of streaming numbers are they doing? What's their kind of follower to listenership ratio? Just start digging into all those numbers and then, and then you know, try to work out what they're doing well. As a side note, do you ever find from artists that they, they might think, we're talking data here, they might, do they ever sort of respond like, well, I'm an artist. I, I don't want to necessarily become a data-driven uh, creator. I mean, and that's a sort of understandable point, right? Because you know, if you're creating art, you want to make sure it's an expression of self. But how are you, how are you able to convince those people that this is actually not impinging on their creative freedom? Um. I think it's I think it's a matter of making people understand that you can dig into this as much as you, as much as you want or as a kind of light touch as you want. Mm. Again, there's services like Chartmetric that just kind of present things to you, and you you can you can just kind of take that at face value, go into those social media platforms, and that's you know that's your basic level of research done, or you can keep hammering into it. So I think it's up to individual artists just to work out what works for them, and then you know when it gets to a certain point, get a manager maybe. Yeah, and, and be comfortable with data, with, yeah. with the data in a way that works with you, I guess. Uh, Patrick, I know there's a flood of questions coming in. Thank you for asking. Yeah, unfortunately, folks. to a bunch of the folks that answer questions, um, they're very off topic, unfortunately. Okay. Um, so I cannot tell you right now about how to interact with Patreon and Instagram personally. Okay. Um, so any questions that we're not able to answer that don't go into the topic, I, I have had a few questions that are on topic. And Jason, if you do have anything else for us, obviously, the number one thing everyone here that's asking specific questions, please read the report It is linked to in the chat, um, chart metric, it's free report, it's online. Uh, but Jason, we've had a few questions about the African market specifically. And did you have you seen anything specifically within within, I guess, suppose the genre, uh, as well as what we've seen coming out of Africa? Is there is there been anything there that you can talk to? Um, barely. Uh, we're still in the middle of the analysis, but for our, the YouTube views, um, we did look at South Africa um, as one of the countries um, of the six that we're looking at, and it's too early to tell. Uh, we still need to really get into it, um, but we're looking forward to it. Okay, cool. So stay tuned for that one. Um, I mean, with that in mind, Jason, first of all, we can, we can start to wrap this up unless uh, if people out there do have any specific questions on, on topic with regards to data and understanding how the what driving decisions based on the change of the, um, the landscape with streaming because of coronavirus. What do you have, any, can you look forward to, you've got, you obviously you've got some data coming in at the moment. I'm not asking you to reveal that uh, before you're, you're releasing it, but do, do you have any, you know, you're in the business of analyzing the data. Can you forecast any sort of, can you sort of see a change in the weather, if you like, what's coming with streaming with regards to what's happening your coronavirus is going to hear for a while. So what, what might be uh, things to learn from this for the future? Yeah, I mean, you know, the, the key word, for, you know, that, that we are looking up is like, you know, effects of, from COVID or coronavirus. But, you know, it's really just the middleman. Really what we're trying to look at is how people's lives have changed. You know, what is it like to work with kids in the house all the time? What does it mean to not have a commute anymore? What does it mean to not be in your car, which is such a huge driver for listenership in America, at least? Um, you know, as you know, this, this goes on and we've all kind of started growing accustomed to it. Maybe that change is starting to kind of go back in the other direction to where things used to be, quote unquote, or maybe it's, you know, reaching like you had mentioned earlier, a new norm. Um, you know, one thing, for example, is, um, you know, we did this test again um, with Spotify Monthly Listenership for all these genres, just kind of get a bigger picture. And uh, children's, for example, you know, we saw a huge like uptick, um, you know, in mid-March, but kind of like, as you know, as April kind of went along, um, it kind of started to level out in terms mm. of their Spotify, the Spotify monthly listenership. So that, you know, tells me that, you know, maybe they've found other ways they've found, downloaded some new iPad games for the kids, or, you know, maybe they subscribe to Disney plus, or, you know, they, they've transferred to other mediums or apps or what have you, you know, there's, you know, a certain time and place um, for each of these things to happen, depending on their, how their lifestyle has either changed yeah. and maybe starting to normalize. So it'll be I mean, interesting to find that going forward. Yeah. You're someone who deals with with data every day um, in, in in a very granular and uh, uh, deep sense, and maybe a lot of people in, especially at the DIY artist level, I'm I'm thinking, or maybe even mid artist level, perhaps uh, they're not doing it in the same kind of way. How is a, is a good way for people to, you know, as all these learnings are coming in? You you had a suggestion that you know perhaps 
there's a lot more children's music being played, but then they're sort of steering away towards video games, perhaps, to watch Travis Scott in Fortnite or something like that. That's a, a, a sort of a slightly off topic example, perhaps. But how would you suggest people look at this and take, you know, it can be overwhelming with, with, with data. How, how's a good way to say, okay, I'm this kind of artist. I, I want to learn something about moving forwards. How, what, what can they look out for as the new, new reports come out in the next few weeks? Yeah, um, you know, as a data company, like we've been trying to, we've tried to be very forward in terms of, you know, creativity is not limited to the studio. You know, what you do with this data can also be very creative. Um, it can be creative, you know, to look at data and be like, oh, cool. There's this person with a similar amount of Instagram followers as me and is in the same genre, um, has a lot of their songs tagged in the same genre. So maybe I should collaborate with that person. Right. It doesn't have to be, oh, Today's top hits is the dopest playlist on Spotify. I got to get on that. Yeah. That's the very surface level obvious thing. Um, and of course it would be great, but you know, it's, there's a lot of creativity that can happen with that as well. You know, for example, I'm trying to think of, you know, ambient, you know, like we found that ambient is like this huge um, kind of genre that's getting a lot of, you know, ears, you know, with everyone in lockdown status, you know, I've seen uh, Gallant, the R&B, American R&B singer. I've seen um, even Will Smith. He has, uh, they both have live YouTube streams now that are playing like lo-fi beats. Right. Um, you know, that's very much in the line of like Chilled Cow and a lot of these um, kind of channels that have been doing it for a while and now they have their own. And they're getting some listenership. They're getting people hanging out, chatting with each other and it's just helping grow their brand. So, so if um, you're an artist and you, you like being creative, it's a, it might be a great opportunity to say, hey, I'm gonna try and make some ambient music, live stream it on, on Twitch or somewhere. And we can talk about it and talk about the world as it's happening while you're creating absolutely. this live ambient music and gain followers and fans that way. I mean, that's, that sounds fun, right? And that's a data-driven uh, decision. 100%. Yeah. 100%. Great, thanks. Uh, Patrick, uh, do we have questions? We do have some questions and I'm going to try to, they're mainly for Jason once again. Uh, Jason, they, they, we've got you now. Um, and I'll try to put these together. There's These two questions sort of go together. One was kind of like, is Spotify a good approximation um, as a data source for all overall genre movement? Um, and then a sort of paired with that question for you all at Chartmetric is, are you able to track the 52 additional countries that Apple expanded to this week? Mm. <laughs> Okay, so the first one, uh, good and bad are always, um, we, we, we don't like those terms very much because it's, it's so subjective what that means, but we can't, I mean, so in the report, if you look in the beginning of it, we, we took a look at um, Spotify's last earnings report, that was in Q4 2019, obviously the, the, the newest one just came out this week, um, but the numbers are not too different, um, so if you look at their monthly active users, it was like 62%, um, I think it was like 61% uh, that came out this week uh, are from either Europe or North America. And then with Latin America, it's like 2022. 20, and then the rest of world, which is like Africa and Asia and like Oceania, like a huge like swaths of population. Pretty substantial, yeah. Are, are kind of in the rest of world category. So, you know, anything we look at with Spotify, it's not good or bad. It's just, it's, it will bias towards North American and European listeners. Yeah. majority speaking um so that's why we kind of put that out there just so to put all of that in context obviously if we could do it with like all the platforms we'd love to but it's just <laughs> it's a lot of work um and then to answer the what was the second part of the question again i forget it was two, it was two parts is whether spotify is the best thing to look at all genres and the second yeah. part was whether the uh, chart metric is tracking the 52 new territories that apple music uh, has expanded into yeah so with apple music um we track a lot of their playlisting, uh, well, all their playlisting for all their territories. So if they put it out, then we have it. Um, so yes, the thing with Apple Music is um, they are a little bit more uh, close to the chest with a lot of their information. So we have playlist histories, you know, for artists and the different tracks that they have and, you know, gathered underneath the different playlist names that Apple Music has. Um, but that's kind of it. We don't get uh, in any of the cool stuff like followers on Spotify or, or monthly listeners. We'd love to, and, but it's just And part, part of that question, which I think you've just answered there, was we had some other questions around what about all the other streaming services, obviously localized, regional ones. And I would guess what you're saying right there is there's a lot of the reason that you work with Spotify data. It's the one that you're able to pull in the most. Mm. If you guys had more data from more services around the world, then of course that would be part of the picture, correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. we'd love to. Um, we, we have another streaming service that's, uh, kind of on the way uh, in that direction, which we're super excited about. Um, but yeah, I mean, just we're very much a data forward company. We think it, it helps everyone involved. Um, so yeah. Okay, 
Great. Right. Uh, thanks, Jason. Um, I mean, I think uh, we, we will sort of uh, wrap up this part of the of the panel uh, at this stage, although uh, I maybe this is a question to be answered uh, offline later, but I'm fascinated why country and Western music uh, is just carrying on at the same rate. And uh, maybe well, I can you answer that. Opinions that you can't share. And I, can answer, I can answer that. Do you want to answer that? Please, go ahead. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So like I'm a Southern boy and I understand right now because I'm talking to my mom and dad and they're based in Georgia. In Georgia, they've just they've just discussed in the state of Georgia that they may close the cinemas. I know, guys, crazy, right? They may close the cinemas in Georgia, uh, and my dad likes to call it the redneck phenomenon, uh, which probably has to do with a lot of people still driving around, still going to shops, still listening to their country music, uh, and uh, not listening to what their government says because yeah. they don't trust them. Uh, making sure that uh, now that's just that's coming from me as a southerner from somebody from Atlanta. Oh, it's good to have an inside source to the to that's, what counts as freedom. That's, that's what I'd say. If I was if I was back in Atlanta right now, I'd be in my pickup truck and I'd be listening to Lord knows I'd be listening to some Hank Williams. <laughs> wow, uh, Jason's staying uh, uh, I think sensibly silent on the issue, and I don't blame him. Uh, so uh, thanks very much, Jason. I think uh, the, the best advice we can give you is. Um, understand from this, as just to wrap it up, that there are, there are some fundamental changes happening to streaming uh, behaviors uh, because of coronavirus and the sort of wider social effects of it. And uh, dig into the report and look out for the future ones. And don't be afraid to make new decisions uh, creatively based on uh, what's going on. Uh, I don't know if, Hen, you have anything to add to that? And then... Uh... I, I have one question and one wish, if, if I'm allowed. <laughs> um, Please question is mexico considered north america for the purpose of this I, we, we couldn't figure that out that that we want to know that so bad because it has such a huge listenership for spotify and just streaming exactly. in general but that's the big question we couldn't figure that out from the earnings reports so right fair enough and and my wish uh if i may be so bold is i understand that obviously you have to look at a very specific you have to look at a small data sample when doing research like this but obviously this is the top 100 artists per genre. I'd love to know what's happening to the, you know, the 500, the 700 biggest artists within the different genres, whether, whether those trends kind of correspond with what's happening with the top end, you know? Are some people moving away from listening to big stadium rock bands, but actually they're digging further into, you know, albums they haven't listened to for years and years, like Patrick was describing before. This is a good question. That's a great question. That's, that's like, an absolutely good that's question. Like is, is that something you're perhaps going to look into, Jason? You're going to, into the longer tail of, of, of music artists? We would love to. I mean, I, I think that makes a lot of sense to me because, you know, if there's anything that we, you know, at least me personally don't like is just looking at the top. You know, everyone, yeah. it, it gets so much attention, but there's so many nuances, just like Ken had just mentioned that, you know, there's, there's some like, you know, emerging like mid-tier kind of artists or bands that, maybe have a completely different like fan behavior. So uh, we would love to look into that. Okay, great. Thank you very much. And I uh, hope to have you get on uh, again soon, Jason. This has been this has been excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, now we're gonna move on as, as the show slowly transitions again further. Can oh, I, Patrick, hi. Can yes. I do one more just while we've still got Jason to say thank Please. you to Chartmetric. Uh, just behind your head, Joe, I see the words youth music. Um, music Ally is launching our creative entrepreneurship program. We just want to thank Chartmetric for being a partner in that. Um, you will find out more, but we're basically trying to help give back uh, in partnership with Youth Music and Chartmetric have been a great sponsor behind that. So I just want to say thank you once again, Chartmetric and Jason for being on the show. Yeah, remove your hat and, uh, and uh, enjoy it, Jason. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, so uh, yes, well, as we slowly transition into a sort of daytime TV uh, light chat program, and I'm very happy with this phenomenon, um, we're looking at good news every week. Uh, Stuart Dredge, who was on earlier and has disappeared to chase uh, children, cats and chickens around his uh, kitchen, um, has been highlighting good news stories every day in the Music Ally mail out, which uh, I strongly recommend you sign up for. And there should be information in the chat about that. Uh, Hen, uh, you and the team at CD Baby have been following this particularly closely as fans of good news. What was notable this week? Um, so it was kind of a continuing story. It started on Monday with um, with the story that the Music Venue Trust here in the UK have launched a campaign or an initiative to save 566 grassroots venues around the country. Um, so far, they've been able to raise over £700,000 uh, in support of these venues. And yesterday, the mayor, Sadiq Khan, announced that he was... Um, he was launching a 2.3 million package to help the culture sector. 450,000 of that is going to the small venues across the country to help, wow. help help them stay in business. So we thought that was worth highlighting because obviously 
grassroots venues are so important to, you know, creative development within a country, having a space where you can go and drink beer and watch a band. Yeah, yeah. I mean, have you, uh, you know, Hen, you, you talk to a lot of artists all the time, as do you, uh, Patrick. Um, have you heard any, from sort of at that, that grassroots level, what people are saying about suddenly they're not allowed to perform? How is this, what is this, how is this impacting on them? Because it's great, obviously, that they're trying to keep these venues open. It's essential. You know, anyone who's been to a sticky floor toilet venue in uh, your local town uh, knows the, the fun of it. But it's obviously incredibly important for artists. What are they saying about it? I mean, I think I think the first couple of weeks of this was maybe maybe a bit more, but maybe worse than what it is now because that was the uncertainty of everything. Yeah. And now now there's a lot of companies and there's a lot of organisations that all you know they have initiatives in place and they're trying to help the artists. A lot of artists are pivoting to different business models, like we've talked about uh, live streaming on Twitch or even you know Facebook Live, Instagram Live, all those different things. Um, but yeah, the first couple of weeks of this was pretty, pretty depressing, to be honest, to get all those emails from artists saying that they've had six months of work cancelled yeah. and no idea how to pay rent. Um, but I think, it's, I think it's looking up. And I think, I think people in general are understanding and they're seeing much more the value of, of art and how important it is in their day-to-day -day life. And, you know, that these small venues, for instance, yeah. are incredibly important. It's certainly been something that this that has come about through coronavirus. That you know, it's the old adage that you don't really know what you've got until you lose it. Um, but people are really understanding, uh, perhaps now more the connection between enjoyment of of art and actually supporting artists. You know, we've we've kind of obfuscated that for a while in that you you pay a flat fee per month and access everything, as we were talking about with Stuart at the beginning. But now perhaps people are understanding that there's a they can sort of take more responsibility in, in a sort of an enjoyable way. Yeah, like one of our, one of our amazing singer songwriters, for instance, he's, he's pivoted, he was, he was supposed to be going on a pretty big European tour now, but instead he's, he's just decided to learn a bucket load of covers and he's uh, kind of effectively renting himself out for, for house party. Wow, okay, that's great. Just playing, playing covers on demand and trying to make a living that way, you know? People are being smart. That is a great idea. Okay, good. Well, so let's keep let's keep following that story. Perhaps we can talk about it again next week as part of uh, I guess we're calling this section uh, "Hen's Good News" uh, with CD Baby. Um, so okay. thank you, Hen. That's, that's very good. And uh, let's keep let's keep track of that. We've got uh, now, uh, Patrick. You did mention here the uh, Music Ally Creative Entrepreneur Program. Yes. Um, a shameless uh, plug for Sh this. shameless plug that we want to help about good news. Yeah, we want to we want to help. So we've been trying to be Music Ally has been trying to become uh, we've been working to become a B Corp this year, a benefit corporation. Um, we're trying to put the Ally in Music Ally. We're really trying to help, um, and we've really thought about what the best way we can do that. We figured the best way we can do that um, is to identify people in need and be able to give uh, some of our services. Um, we realized that the best way to find those people in need would be go with a partner, not to just have to come directly to us. So we partnered with Youth Music. I have just put the link in here uh, to our creative entrepreneurship uh, program. We'll basically be taking um, uh, at-risk youth, uh, young people that wouldn't be able to otherwise afford our services, um, support them with uh, learning and education materials, uh, eventually mentorships. Um, we're going to have an award uh, off the back of it. So we really just want to encourage these young creators, uh, as well as young aspiring industry professionals, uh, to give them a shot um, that, you know, maybe they don't get because of uh, because of background or finance. Um, and that's what we're trying to do. And thank you, Chartmetric, for helping sponsor it. And we will, um, this is the first time we're doing this. We're going to try and do a lot more of these in other countries. Um, this is obviously right. very, it's a little bit UK focused with youth music, um, but we will be trying to do this all around the world. So please watch and share and support because obviously here we all are, uh, but there's a whole community out there of artists and musicians and, and aspiring industry professionals that, that need a bit of help. And that's what we're all, we're all here trying to do. Great. And a natural partnership with Chartmetric, of course, sharing information and things like that. And that is for 18 to 25 year olds from uh, difficult backgrounds at the moment in the UK and looking to expand in the future. So the link to that, if you if you think you're interested in that and you want to perhaps partner up or support that, uh, if you're on the business side or if you think you're actually um, uh, eligible and would like to take part in that, the link is on uh, the in the chat. It's musically.com forward slash creative hyphen entrepreneur, but you can probably just find it in the chat much easier than writing that down as I say it. Uh, so that's about it uh, for this week. Um, don't forget you can follow Music Ally on social media, etc. Uh, at Music Ally on Twitter, at Music Ally FB on Facebook. Next week, 
uh, is a public holiday in the UK and many European countries, but the week after on the 15th of May, uh, a reminder that we should be uh, discussing innovative releasing strategies in 2020, uh, which will tie in quite nicely with this conversation about, uh, you know, maybe yeah. if you've got an ambient record uh, in, uh, hiding in your catalog, now is the time to shove it mm -hmm. on uh, streaming yeah. services and take advantage of that. Can, um, I, I, uh, can I also just give a shout out to the please. rest of our audience who will be joining us later on YouTube? I've had a few people ask that actually clicked on the YouTube link here. We will put all of these on YouTube. So obviously what we're saying in the chat, once this is rebroadcast, look, look in the YouTube description. Yes. We'll make sure to put these links in there. Um, but that's a way to reach a much wider audience. We're, we're thankful for everyone that joins us actually on Zoom. Hopefully if you're seeing this on YouTube, you think, hey, I might want to ask questions next time. But we will always be putting this on the Music Ally TV show uh, uh, YouTube channel, which we've got links to all over the place. And we'll be talking about it. For sure. If, you, if you're watching on YouTube and you have a, a question and you can't ask live, there is an email address below the YouTube video and you can you can uh, hit that and ask the question and it'll get answered. Uh, that's how it works at Music Ally. So there you go. Uh, that's it. Uh, thank you. First of all, very special guest, uh, guest uh, Jason Hoven from Chart Metric. It's been a pleasure, Jason. Uh, I hope you do join us again. Uh, Hen, as always, from CD Baby for your input and for being here and your good news. It's good news just having you, but it's a pleasure having you as well. Thanks for having me. Always a pleasure, never a chore. And uh, the man hiding his uh, coronavirus hair, uh, Patrick, as always, it's been a pleasure. Thank you very much. Oh, no, it's there. It's, it's absolutely fine. OK. Good. Uh, thanks for joining us, everybody. Uh, and uh, well, we'll see you in two weeks' time. And uh, well, uh, stay safe, happy, and well in the meantime. Farewell. Goodbye. <laughs>